We are still in our series of Kings and Kingdoms. Last week, Matt did a great job of preaching about Saul. And the whole idea of this series is that no matter who is on an earthly throne, God is on the throne that actually matters. And so what that should do is it should give us peace in the middle of an election season that is meant to draw out fear. It's meant to make, make us anxious. It's meant to make us really think that whoever sits in that White House determines our level of peace. And it's just not true. And the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I know that it's true. I think there's times where you're like, I think it's true, I'm pretty sure it is, but I don't feel like it. (laughs) But the longer you walk with him, find some people who have gone before you, find some people who have endured a lot of elections, and they will say, listen, the peace that passes all understanding belongs to you because of who God is, and it has nothing to do with who sits in an office, right? So we got to talk about King Saul last week and why he um, got put where he was and that God basically allowed it. It was his passive will. He's like, okay, this is what the people keep asking for and I'm gonna allow it for a season. But it was only for a season and then that ushered in the King David era. And so we're gonna look a little bit about King David and that was a little bit of an overwhelming thought of King David. Let's just talk about him. There's not much to choose from, right? And so I'm like, in this situation, I'm like, there's so much that we could talk about of why King David would be called, first of all, a man after God's own heart. No one else in scripture was called that. So there's something in the life of David, there's something in his character, there's something in the way that he lived his life and in the way that he ruled and reigned that is a reflection of God, right? Not every single thing, but his main character, his main heart. And so David was a man after God's own heart. Um, To think that God chose David literally because of who he was on the inside is just beautiful because that is not how kings were chosen. (laughs) That is not how rulers were chosen. They were chosen by their lineage. They were chosen by their family. They were chosen by their status or their finances or something like that. Um, But God chose David because he was a man after his own heart, and that was before he ever did anything to show him that he was a man after his own heart. So don't think that God's purposes and plans aren't like deeply woven inside of you even from the time that you're born because they are in first samuel verse uh first samuel 13 verse 14 it says you have done a foolish thing so this is when um samuel is basically confronting saul you've done a foolish thing samuel said you have not kept the command the lord gave you If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. So Samuel is approaching Saul back, the story that Matt told us last week, saying you did something you weren't supposed to do and you knew it and you covered it up and even when you were confronted, you made excuses. And we talked about how we don't follow people who cannot own up to their mistakes and when when they know that they are wrong. Um, He says, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And Matt shared with us last week that this was about the time that David was probably born. So again, he's not even doing anything yet that would earn him the right of that title. And then in Acts 13, 22, this is when um, Paul is referring back to this story in the New Testament. He says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. So God testified concerning David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. So not only is David a man after God's own heart, he is the one that God chose his lineage to bring about the Savior, Jesus, that Kia talked with, talked with us about this morning. What an honor. What an honor. So time passes, as it does, and David is anointed to be king when he's around 12, 13 years old. 
in 1 Samuel 16. So I'm gonna read a lot of scripture this morning because the Bible does so much of a better job of telling this story than I would be able to tell you concisely. Um, So we are gonna digest a lot of scripture this morning, but the word is alive and it's living and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So don't be like, oh my goodness, she read so much scripture in church during a sermon. This is the time we're allowed to do that. So listen, be ready. I say this every time that I speak, but I also do this every single time I am on the other side of someone else speaking. I am prepared. Lord, I know that you're getting ready to speak to me. I know that you're getting ready to point out something in this scripture that I have never, I've never seen it that way. I've never heard it that way before. There's something that you're getting ready to tell me that's new that's fresh, you're here for a rhema word this morning. This is not a downloaded sermon from somebody else's series. This is something that the Lord spoke to me this week. He's here to give you fresh bread, fresh word. Can I pray over you this morning? Lord, I thank you for the privilege that it is to hear your word. I thank you for the privilege that it is to even be in your presence as we were just singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy forever, your name is the highest, the greatest. So Lord, as we dig into your word, as we dig into this man, David, who was a person who was flawed, but a man after your own heart, I pray that there would be something inside of us that turns. I pray that there would be something inside of us that sees things in ourselves that you see in us that might be hard, but it's worth it to obey you and to follow you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So David's about 12 years old. 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, sure, so this is the, the oldest son of Jesse, and he is tall and handsome and muscular, and they're like, that looks like a king. Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And he goes on in verse 13 to say, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. He's the youngest of eight, mind you. (laughs) Youngest brother gets anointed as the next king of Israel. From, the, from that day, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. So then, what happens after that? He just, they're like, I'm just, I don't know, my imagination runs sometimes, and I'm like, what do you do after that? Like, the prophet comes to town, he picks out the youngest son, they literally have to bring him in from the fields because he was just out, I'm thinking eighth kid. My mom's the eighth daughter or the eighth child in her family. And she's like, I was always just like around. Like nobody was even, <laughs> nobody was even really paying attention. They're like, I don't know, has anybody seen Kim in a few days? Like, it's been a while. Like we thought she'd at least come eat. And I imagine that that's how David was just, they're just like, he's like out there, he's doing the stuff that nobody else wanted to do. Because that's what I would think about the eighth son, the youngest son in the family. Guess what? Not it, not it, not it, not it. That goes to David. Let him do the stuff that nobody else wants to do. But scripture shows us that David was faithful in doing the task at hand. David was faithful for doing what was right in front of him. So that's our first point. David was faithful with the task at hand, even though he knew he was created for more. He knew he was created for more, but he was still faithful with the task at hand. And what I feel that the Lord spoke to me through this was there are so many seasons in my life where God showed me things. He gave me these feelings that like, I'm going to do this through you, or even prophetic words where somebody somebody would come speak over me and say, I see this and I see that. And I'm thinking like, I don't see any of that, but okay. But nothing happened right away. I just went back to doing what I was doing. And there's something that's a little like, you're like, ah, and then it's like, 
Okay, so he gets anointed. Big thing in front of his, um, in the presence of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He gets anointed. When they were anointed back in the day, that was not like our little thing of oil. It was like pour it on from the top of the head, goes down to the feet. And then it's like, okay, well, I guess you just go back to the field. Go back and keep the sheep. But David was faithful with the task at hand. He was faithful with tending his father's sheep. And I'm just imagining that in that season of being out by himself, doing what he was asked to do, and the spirit of the Lord was upon him in that season. And this was not something that was available to everyone at that time. The spirit of the Lord had to choose you and come upon you for just a season. And that's why Acts 2 is such a big deal when his spirit gets to be poured out upon all people. And that's what's available for us today. So we can't imagine a time where it was just like you. I'm choosing you for this season. My spirit is going to be upon you. So he had relationship with the Lord that was precious. And he's out in the field. And I imagine he's just talking to him. And he's like, okay, what is this king thing about? Like, what, when is it going to happen? I'm still out here doing all the things that nobody else wants to do. He was faithful serving his family. Faithful serving the sheep. Um, during that season, he developed skills <laughs> um, that, no, that he couldn't have picked up anywhere else. And so that's even a word for us today, that there are times in your season where you feel like you are on the longest pause of what God has called you. There's such a gap between what has God has called you to do and then him actually completing that in you or even starting that work in you and you just feel like you're in the messy middle. Has anybody ever been in the messy middle? We spend most of our lives in the middle. His ways are higher than ours. His timing is so much different than ours and we feel like we're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And listen, I'm telling you, when you feel like you've been waiting too long, you are on track because it's always gonna feel too long for us. It's gonna feel unfair it's going to feel like everybody has been passing us up. And when it feels too long and so long and so long that you feel like you're about to scream, get ready because the Lord is about to do something. Do not become frustrated. Do not become weary in doing good and being faithful to him or being faithful to what feels like a menial task. The Lord is using you. The Lord is growing things and developing things in you. Um, in 1 Samuel 17, 32, it talks about where um, Jesse sent David, so David was not yet old enough to go to war. So Jesse, his father, sent him to go check on his brothers who were serving the king during that time, and they let him know that um, he was like, just go check and see if they're okay, bring them some food, all that kind of good stuff. And so he goes, and he hears this giant that's taunting the Israelites, and he's taunting God, and he's, he is talking down about who God is. And David's sitting there going like, and I'm imagining that spirit, that anointing that was on his life. Those of you who are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you know that when you come up against something that is against God, against what the Holy Spirit is a different kind of spirit that doesn't agree with yours. There's something that just comes up inside of you and you're like, oh no, 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 no. We are not, we are not going to accept that. That is not what God wants. And so I'm imagining there's this thing welling up inside of him. He's like, you are not talking about my God that way. You are not going to like, who does this guy think he is? He's nine feet tall. <laughs> that didn't seem to bother him. It, it didn't matter to him because he's like, well, the spirit of the Lord is like in disagreement with this is not okay. So basically he's like asking his brothers, he's asking people, he's like, why, why isn't anybody doing anything about this guy? And they're like, you are ridiculous. Who do you think you are? You show up here in the middle of this thing and you think you know what's best for everybody and also you're the little brother, you don't know anything. So. Saul overhears this. David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. This is in 1 Samuel 17. I don't know if we have this on the screens, but um, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. This is when he goes back to his time of preparation. Your servant, so this is what I've been doing. 
I've not just been sitting out in the field, I've been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued it, the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it, I killed it. He is a teenage boy who is literally grabbing lions by their hair, opening up their mouth, taking the sheep out of it. Preparation for his future. I went after it, I struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who raised me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord will be with you. I'm imagining Saul just listening to this. He's like, listen, it sounds like a better resume than anybody else has presented so far. Let's give you a shot. David had no way of knowing that all of his time in obscurity, all of his time in the fields just being faithful to what God had called him to do at the time, tending the sheep, was preparing him and developing him for a greater call in his life. How could he have ever even known that he was preparing to kill a giant? nine feet tall, that the rocks that he used to um, practice with killing all kinds of other animals, that this would be his preparation for killing Goliath and therefore starting his path to the throne. This is for the students. You have no idea what God is preparing you with right now. You have no idea that your season, this is for everybody, but especially if you are young, You have no idea what seems random, what seems like just a fluke, or what just seems like, oh, they keep asking me to do this or do that. Say yes. When it's the Lord, say yes. Say yes. Don't ask any questions, and then just keep following him, and just keep following him, because you will see when you get to a place, and maybe some of you, you already know what God has called you to. Some of you, you already know God has placed dreams in your heart. Maybe there's been prophetic words over your life, and you're like, that just seems so far-fetched so far away. Be faithful with what God's called you to for this season because he will use it. He will use it in the seasons to come. And it may be the most random stuff that you're like, how could he ever redeem this? How could he use it? And he will. He will if you're faithful to the thing that he's called you to do. For everyone else, people may never see your years sown in obedience. People may never know the faithfulness, the seeds of faithfulness that you have planted. But God sees it. And he's the only one that matters. So if you feel like you're not being recognized or you feel that those, like, God, do you even see me? Do you see me? I feel like I've just been working and toiling and toiling. And he's like, if it's for me, it's worship. And it's enough. God sees you and he's the only one that matters. But listen on the other side of this, because we see this with Saul and with other people as well. Don't be tempted to see someone's perceived sudden success as something that you should be jealous over. Or somebody passed you by, where did this person come from? I've been here, you know, doing this all this time. Have you ever felt that way? Like, am I the only honest person in the room? (laughs) I've been here, I've been serving, I've been toiling, I've been doing this, I've been do- I just feel like I'm invisible and I feel like everybody keeps passing me up. And it could be with the silliest stuff. If we got real today, the enemy has told you some dumb stuff and you started believing it and you're like, yeah, that's probably true. There's probably a conspiracy against me. Honestly, if I think about it, everybody's probably talking about it and it's this big plan, you know, and it's really... We don't know the price somebody else paid for the season that they've gone through that nobody knows about that seems sudden. If somebody came to you and said, what is this sudden success you have? You would be like, you have no idea. If you're an athlete, all of a sudden maybe you get famous for one amazing play on a Sunday afternoon and everyone's like, where'd this guy come from? And this guy's like, you didn't see me playing in elementary school, in middle school, and in high school, in every workout and all this stuff and you think I'm just a sudden success story. And it almost cheapens your experience. But we do it all the time with other people, whether it's inward or outward. Where'd this person come from? I've been here. I've been working. And all of a sudden, we're comparing 
their price with our price. Well, the, the price I've prayed for my journey is, is higher, so I should get a turn first. And all of a sudden, God is looking at his kids being like, we are not preschoolers. <laughs> but we're acting like it. Don't be tempted to do that because especially in the church, y'all, it's so ugly. It's so ugly. We are all on the same team. We are all a part of the same family. And I don't just mean in this church, but I mean in church culture that has become really confusing in this season, especially like the church celebrity culture, which God never intended to be a thing. Ugh. I think it's as gross to him as it is to me, and I think it's worse. I think it's worse. Number two, David obeyed the Lord even when it was inconvenient for him. I'm just gonna give us a quick flyover of, um, so basically, this is when David is not king yet. This is when Basically, he gets a lot of fame, a lot of notoriety for killing the giant. They're like, where'd this guy come from? This is amazing. And then he, Saul starts to utilize him. He's like, this guy, I mean, he's, he's, he's a good guy. He, he seems to know his way around uh, weaponry and war. And so let's start using him to win some battles. And then David starts winning. And he starts doing really, really well. And then Saul's like, hold on. I want you to be good, but I don't want you to be better than me. And people start talking about Saul has won his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And they're not trying to say, Saul, you're bad, but they're trying to say, David, you're great, but he can't hear it that way. And so he does what anybody would do, and he's just like, well, I'm going to kill him, obviously. <laughs> I'm just going to knock him out. So he literally is like, I'm going to go kill him. And so David spends a ton of his time on the run, hiding from Saul, who is like, I want to kill you. And especially, um, it, Saul's daughter falls in love with David and wants to become his wife, and she does become his wife, and he's like, wow, this guy has a hold on people. Um, this is in 1 Samuel 18, 28. It says, when Saul realized that the Lord was with David, and I think that was the first thing that just messed him up. Because if you remember, about the time where Samuel confronted um, Saul, scripture says that the Lord removed his spirit from him and he took him out of his presence. And I think when Saul recognized that presence, that spirit that was on David, he was jealous. And he was like, I remember what that used to be to feel that. But I, and he knew what he did to take himself out of that. It says, um, Saul became more afraid of him and remained his enemy the rest of his days. The Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did, David was met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. So this is in his time of running. Um, David has two opportunities to kill Saul, at least that we know of that are well documented. He has, two, he has multiple opportunities, but there, these were two opportunities where Saul was completely un, not expecting it. One of them... Saul had gone into a cave to use the restroom. And he didn't know that David and his men were hiding in the back of that cave. And there's this opportunity. He's exposed. He's not expecting it. And David's men are like, I mean, could God have set this up any better? And then David has this conviction of like, I'm not going to kill him, but I am going to let him know that I was close. So he cuts off the bottom of his robe. He keeps it. And then later on, he takes it out and he shows him like, I could have killed you. Um, we're gonna look at 1 Samuel 24. So, tall, so Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men. So this is like while he was trying to kill him. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, so Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day that the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give you your, your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed, caught the corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to the men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed one of Israel. David knew that it was not his season. He knew it, and because he was filled with the Spirit of the Lord, he felt conviction. Conviction, listen, 
Everyone around him was telling him what to do. These were good people. And they were like, one plus one equals two. God said he's gonna deliver you. He's right here in front of you. It writes itself. And that shows you the danger sometimes, even well-meaning people in your life. Well, if this happened, and you've been praying about this, one plus one equals two. This is easy, like God, like he just answered your prayer. If you are not discerning, if you are not discerning and if you are not hearing that conviction of the Holy Spirit on a regular basis that sometimes we want to avoid because it can be uncomfortable, um, you may be making a mistake. And it's just, it's an important thing to know that like God's voice supersedes all of the other voices in our lives, even when they are godly voices, even when. And I love that he doesn't like David doesn't condemn them because he's like, no, it, like, honestly, it made sense. <laughs> it made perfect sense. But he was even convicted of taking that little piece of the robe. And then whenever he basically shows Saul how close he was to him, Saul is undone. He is so humbled. He's like, you had every, op- like, I'm literally trying to kill you. And you had the opportunity to hurt me, to kill me, and you didn't take it. And it says that Saul was repentant. <laughs> that he fell before his face. Um, a second time, there's a time where Saul is sleeping and there is a spear and a jug by his head. And this is later on. And things have gotten much, much worse for David in this time and it would have made a lot of sense for him to kill Saul. But he doesn't do it. He takes, um, he takes the jug, he takes the spear, Again, just to let him know I was close, but even then, God can fix him again. (laughs) Why did you do that? Why did you do that? That was more about you than it was about him. That was more about you making a point than it was about you being obedient to me. How often do we do that? I have every right to make this point. I have every right to prove that I am right. I have every right to stand on my convictions and be a total jerk because I'm right. Matt and I say often to, this, this happens um, in marriage counseling most often, um, you can be right or you can have relationship. Which one do you wanna choose? This comes up with marriage counseling and it comes up with parents of adult children. Do you want to be right or do you wanna have relationship? Because most of the time you don't get to pick which one. You don't get to pick both, you get to pick one of those. And most of the time when we think we're right, It's not righteous. We just believe that we know best. And listen, sometimes you really are right if there is a right and wrong in this situation. But are you going to stand on that? Are you going to lean into relationship? Because David is reminded them of all of these relational things that are at play here all of the future that he has with his kingdom, there's more at stake than just being right in that moment. And he could have chosen to be right in that moment, but he chose to be obedient to the Lord instead. And that is hard. (laughs) Anybody ever been in that moment? I could say something right now that would shut this conversation down. And the Holy Spirit says, shut your mouth. He says, I will deal with this. I will deal with their heart. I will be the one who deals with this, and this is not your job right now. Oh, the self-control. David was exhibiting the fruit of the spirit of self-control so much in that season. Um, A good leader, a good leader, a great leader is filled with self-control. They are the ones that do not say the thing. They do not say the thing that they could say because they see the bigger picture. They see the greater um, influence that they could have. And that they know, like, if I choose this battle right now, I might lose my influence later in the future, so I'm gonna gonna hold this. I'm gonna hold this. Number three, David listened to those who gave him sound advice. Mm. I love these two stories so much, and these are not often looked at. Um, I feel like these are not often highlighted in the story of David, but as I was listening through all of this, listen, I listened to David's life like it was a podcast this week. I listened to, I think, 60 chapters of between 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and then into 1 Kings, and I told Matt, I was like, if this was on TV, my kids wouldn't be allowed to watch it. (laughs) I mean, it's, 
it's something. If you want to just really get into it, you really uh, just press play on your Bible app and just fold your laundry and do your dishes and, and do all the things and just listen to this story. Um, and also, if you want to feel like, okay, I'm not the worst person in the world. There's people who have made way more mistakes than me, and God still used them. But these stories stuck out as I was praying, God, what is it that you want us to hear? What is it that you want us to see through David's life today, fresh and new? And there's this story of Abigail. So this is before David is king. This is kind of actually in between those two stories that I just told you, the two times where he had the opportunity to kill Saul. So this happens right in the middle of that. So he's still on the run, he's still hiding. And this is after Samuel died, but before he was crowned king. So this is still the messy middle, and it's just wild how long the middle goes on for David. But there was this man named Nabal, and he was super rich, super wealthy. He loved everything for himself, and David and his men had been helping to kind of watch over his land, watch over, um, even had relationship with his shepherds, all this kind of stuff. And um, they were really good to his men, really good to his people. And um, really for no reason other than just to be kind. But then he realizes like, hey, it's sheep shearing season, which is when normally like things are, the crops are good and like there's going to be maybe... Um, festivals and all these different things. And so he's like, hey, David approaches him. He's like, hey, so you have a lot. Um, Or actually his men approach him on behalf of David. And he's like, hey, would you mind sharing with us? Like, we've been really kind to your people. We've been really, we've helped them out a lot. And is there any way you could share with us? Because basically, like, we're hungry. (laughs) Could you share with us? And Nabal's just such a jerk, and he's like, yeah, no. He's like, I don't even know you. He's like, I don't wanna give you anything. Why would I share anything that I have with you? And so the men, like David's men come back to him and they're like, so he, like, he doesn't wanna share. Like he doesn't wanna give you anything, give us anything, and he actually doesn't care that we have been super kind to all of his people, and that's probably why they're even enjoying some of the spoils that they're enjoying right now, but he doesn't care. <clears throat> so then David is like, not on my watch. He's frustrated because he's a normal person and it makes him furious because Nabal didn't just say like, no thanks. He like, he hurled insults at David. He brought up things and he even was like Jesse's son because Jesse was not like a prominent man. So he was like, let me remind you where you came from. You're no one, you're nobody. And do you know what else? It was in this town that Nabal lived in that this is where Saul erected his own monument to himself. So this was Saul territory. This was team Saul. And so they were not having it with David. And so it was extremely unkind. And so David's like, well, I'm going to get you. (laughs) Then there's Abigail, who is Nabal's wife. And scripture says she was filled with wisdom and she was beautiful. And she goes to David who she knows he's anointed to be the next king of Israel, and she realizes, like, with a, just the word of his mouth, he could take her life. Because she's going to him, she hears what David's plans are, and she's like, I don't think he's supposed to do that. <laughs> One, she's a woman. Back then, no power, no authority, no really reason to be able to approach a soon-coming king. But she has faith, She's wise, and she's like, I just know that I know that this is not right. This is not how David should be handling this. And so she goes to David, and this is just part of the narrative. This is in 1 Samuel 25. It says, when the Lord had fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel. So she's speaking future tense. She's actually prophesying. She's reminding David of who he is created to be. So she's saying, when the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. Because God, this was not something that God was endorsing. God had not told David to take Nabal's life. David was just in his feelings, and his feelings were hurt, and he was angry. And he felt like it was justified. 
So sends Abigail to basically remind him of who he is, remind him of his calling. And David said, so this is something that's so, so good about David. David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have lived by daybreak. He would have wiped them out. So then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him, because she brought him food. She brought him all of the things that he needed. She's like, listen, I'm going to bring everything that you requested, and I'm also going to take a chance and tell you, hey, that plan you have, it's a bad plan. And I can't explain to you fully, but I'm going to remind you of who you are. Keep your eyes set before you on the bigger picture, because this is not the kind of blood you want on your hands when you take the throne. God has not endorsed this. And so quickly, David said, praise God, thank you for coming to me so quickly. There was no argument. There was no back and forth. There was no like, well, do you know who I am? And who are you to come to me? And listen, as a leader, as a leader, many of you, you know, we're not going to be president. Maybe some of you will be someday. I hope so. Those would be better choices if you're in this room, I I guarantee. (sighs) Um, Maybe. Pray about it, please. Um, I won't, but you should. Uh, But many of us, we may not be the president, or we may not be the CEO of a company, or we may not, but listen, each and every one of you, God has placed you in an area of leadership. And if you're not right now, you will be. In your home, you're a leader. In your workplace, you're a leader. In your kids' lives, you're a leader. In your company, you're a leader. Come on, it goes on and on. In your neighborhood, you're a leader. People look to you. When somebody comes to you and says, hey, I know you have every reason to do that, but I'm just letting you know, I don't think it's a good idea. Our response as believers, as long as it's something that's coming from the Lord, should be, thank you for letting me know. And humility should follow. Be very careful of a leader who is confronted by somebody who is godly, by somebody who really has heard from the Lord, and they're like, you've been doing your job five minutes. I've been here for, you know, 15 years, and, you know, whatever, all this kind of stuff. And if that is your natural reaction, that is something you need to pray about it. And so maybe if you're not to the point yet where the Lord hasn't done enough of that work in your life, or maybe you have not allowed him to do enough of that work in your life, because some of y'all, we've been following Jesus for a really long time, and there's really no good reason why that fruit of the Spirit should not be prominent and overflowing in our lives. But if, if it has not been worked in you yet, allow the Lord the opportunity to work it in you. And at least pause. At least don't give your natural fleshly reaction to be like, well, I've been, and you don't know, and and, you know, I'm the authority in this. At least pause. Consider for a second that you might be wrong. And at least receive what somebody is saying to you. And at least, at the very least, go pray about it the very least, and at the most, receive it, pray about it, go back to them and say, you were right and I was wrong. Thank you. Thank you for coming to me. Um, There's another time with the prophet Nathan, and this isn't like a negative, but this is a positive, but this is after um, David is back in Jerusalem, the ark is back in Jerusalem, all is right in, uh, with David's world right now. He's anointed as king, He has um, fought battles and won. He knows that the Lord is with him. He's working all of these things out. All of these dreams that he's given David are coming to pass. And then David is sitting in his palace, and he's like, it's not fair that I get to be in this beautiful palace, but the ark of the Lord is outside in a tent. Like, I don't feel good about that. Like, I feel like the ark of the Lord, which was where his presence resided in the Old Testament, That is where his presence resided. And you can go through scripture, anyone who touched it died because that was how powerful the presence of the Lord was. And 
he has this like ache in his heart and I imagine that he's just like, it just doesn't seem fair. I'm just a person and I'm just somebody who's like wicked and somebody who like has all these flaws, but like God is using me, but yet the presence of the Lord is in an ark that's sitting outside in a tent and it just doesn't feel right to me. And so he has a good idea, which was, I am going to build a temple for the Lord. Because up until this point, they've been doing like mobile church, right? Church planting. And so they're meeting in tents. <laughs> and they're setting up every week and tearing down, setting up and tearing down. And they're like, okay, are we following the cloud? Are we following the fire? And they're just doing all these different things. But he's like, it feels like it's time. And listen, that is a good idea. Like, I'm, re- I'm like, this seems good. This seems good. And even to Nathan, who's a prophet of the Lord, he's like, David, that sounds good. I think you should do this thing that you're talking about. Like you should, you, you know, I think you should move forward with that. And then Nathan goes to pray about it because Nathan was not operating in that moment as a prophet. He was being David's friend. And that was something that stood out in scripture. I was like, wow, because he was just hearing what David said. And he was like, yeah, it seems like a good idea. It doesn't sound wrong doesn't sound bad, so like you should do it. And then he goes to pray about it, and the Lord gives Nathan like this word, this prophetic word over David. And part of it is in, um, I actually didn't put the reference, but the part of it, it starts in verse 11, and it says, the Lord declares that you, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. So this is God talking to David. He's basically telling him that he will establish a kingdom for David that goes on forever, forever. And David's vision is so limited, he's thinking he wants to build a temple for the Lord and that will probably be his legacy. So the Lord interjects and he's like, David, I'm not condemning you, your heart is good. Your your heart is in the right place. But what I have in mind for you is so much bigger than that one thing. And so he basically tells him this. Um, He said, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. When he's talking about, I will bring somebody else from your offspring to build a house for myself, he's talking about Solomon someone who's not born yet, he's like, you are going to have a son that's going to do this very thing that you're wanting to do, but it's not your season. And this isn't the kind of legacy that I'm, that you, you are basically building this legacy for yourself, even though your heart is right. But I have something else in mind. I have something bigger. He goes on basically to tell David, like, all of the things that are gonna come to pass in David's life, all of these things that it's not gonna stop with him. He's like, and then your children, and their children, and their children, and then he tells him that the Messiah is gonna be, in in some words, he basically tells him the Messiah then is gonna come, and the rule and reign is gonna be forever in your lineage, because Jesus comes from the lineage of David, and he rules and reigns forever. And so David is seeing such a small component and, the God, and God is trying to show him through the prophet Nathan, I have something so much bigger in store and in mind for you. And so he doesn't rebuke David, but he's like, don't build the temple, that's gonna be reserved for your son. And later on we find out that the reason for this is because David was created as a man of war. That was his gifting, that was his preparation. He was prepared to be a man of war and that was his gifting. And Solomon, that was not his gifting, but David's purpose was to prepare the way of peace so that when the time came, Solomon could build that temple and it, they would flourish and that there would be, um, they wouldn't be fighting all of these battles that they're fighting right now. And isn't it just like us sometimes to have this good idea that's not a God idea? because we can't see the fullness of what he's actually trying to do. And he's not condemning us when he says, not right now, or no, that's not you. That's actually gonna be somebody else's job. And I'm sure David would have rather built the temple than to finish fighting all of the wars that he was gonna need to fight in order to prepare the way for peace. When God interrupts our good plans so that his perfect plans can come to pass, trust him. 
when he interrupts our good plans, and this this is a word for somebody today, you have been sitting with disappointment because the good thing that you really thought was the God thing has not come to pass in your life. And so one of two things is happening. Either you need to pray about that more, seek the Lord, God, is it just not your right timing, or am I not the person? And let him deal with that with you. But like, there are so many things that are good things that are not God things, and we have to grieve them. To say it was good. Or maybe it was for a season, but it's not for right now. And then the last thing is that David was quick to repent when he was confronted about sin. And I would gather that most of us in the room are very familiar with the story of Bathsheba and Uriah. But a quick flyover is that David... Actually, let's just bring up 2 Samuel 11, 1. Let's just show where this started, or not where it started, but where it starts for us um, in the narrative. In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. What was David created for? What did I just say? For war. What was he gifted for? A man of war. Leadership. Leading them into fighting these wars so that there could be peace later on for the people that would come after him. But you know what comes before 2 Samuel 11 is a lot of victories. A lot of victories. He won a lot of wars. He gained a lot of confidence. And then all of a sudden, we see David acting outside of himself. He stayed behind and sent his people when it was his role, his job to go to war and to lead. And for some reason that we don't know, we can only assume from scripture that maybe he either got tired or he lost sight of why God created him, what he created him to do. Maybe he got prideful and he was just like, oh, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. They don't need me, I'm just gonna stay home. And when he ended up sinning with Bathsheba, which is where he was somewhere he wasn't supposed to be, wrong place at the wrong time, he was napping in the middle of the day, not what kings do, Um, he sins. And not only does he sin with, he takes a look and then he takes a second look. And then he's like, takes more than that. And he's like, oh, someone bring her to me. Then he starts abusing his authority. And he's like, oh, wait, I'm the king. I'm, I, I can do anything I want. Come to me. You're going to be mine now. So he sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. Then she lets him know she's pregnant. And he's like, oh, shoot. That's not, <laughs> like, I thought this was like a one-time thing. And... The story gets so much worse. And I believe if you look at scripture, there were opportunities for grace and repentance, grace and repentance, grace and repentance, but he just keeps, I'm gonna make this right. I'm gonna make this right in my own human way. So he, through a lot of series of events, he basically kills Bathsheba's husband. He has him killed in war, but the blood is on his hands. Because Uriah is such a good man that even when David keeps like, oh, you should come home and take a break from war, and oh, you should hang out with your wife for a while, and whatever you guys do is, you know, up to you, and, um, and Uriah's like, I can't do this while my men are out at war. And listen, the reason that that was Uriah's response is because that's how David had discipled him. That is how David had led him. We do not leave our brothers behind when they're in war. And then Uriah actually starts using the conviction that David had taught them about, and David's like, oh, this guy, he's too good. And then he tries again, and Uriah still won't go home and be with his wife, because he's like, that's not what we do when we're in war. We don't leave our people behind. And I think he's probably even confused why David's asking him to do it. He's like, you taught us this. You're the one who has taught us to be this way and to have this conviction, and what has happened? And so he sends him back to war and then David is caught in a corner and he's like, okay, the only thing I know to do to fix this is to eliminate him. And he does. This act is so outside of David's character. This act is so harsh. This is in the character of King Saul. 
This is in the character of other kings. This is in the character of other, the way they ruled and reigned and abused their power to get what they want. And everybody's just a chess piece in their kingdom. But David had always been about building God's kingdom. And then David, or God brings um, Nathan, the prophet, to David. He sends him to him to confront him. And this is a heartbreaking part of scripture. Because God basically tells, because he knows David so well. He's like, tell him this story. So he tells him about a story of this rich ruler who has everything, and this guy who has just this little cute little baby lamb, and he's like taking care of it, and even like letting it grow up in his house. And this, this meanwhile, this ruler has like everything. He's got sheep and goats and cattle and like all the money and all these things. And then a visitor comes to town, and he's like, instead of killing one of his own animals to give the meal for this visitor, he like, hey, that guy who has that one little thing, that's the only thing he has, take it from him, and that's going to be our meal. And so he tells this to David as if it's like somebody in his kingdom, and David is enraged. He's like, who could do such a thing? This is disgusting. This is so against, like, you know, these are not the way that my people should act. And (laughs) Nathan looked at him. He goes, you are that man. You are that man. This is actually David's response. So it says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, again, this fictional person, he doesn't know he's fictional. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. David, Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I gave you, I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? And David's response is simply this. He said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He made no excuses. He knew, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But then he does go on to let him know that there is gonna be a slew of consequences. Because when the Lord forgives, he forgives and he restores relationship, but he does not take away the consequences. And that is scripture upon scripture upon scripture. So there is actually a way to be restored back into relationship with the Lord after we've sinned, after we've done horrible, horrible things. Restored back into relationship with the Lord and still live with the consequences that the Lord says, because you did this. In this situation, the son that was conceived between them, he died. David fasted and prayed for seven days because he didn't want it to be true, and he knew it was his fault, and it still came to pass, and that is a heavy, heavy, heavy burden to bear. But after that time was over, he stood up, he was reconciled with the Lord, and he went on, and it wasn't that he forgot about it, but he knew that like his timing, time of mourning was over, and he had to go and be the man that God created him to be. And for some of us, listen, this is just, I feel the word for maybe somebody in the room today. You are living with legitimate consequences of some things that you've done. Now you're in relationship with the Lord. And there's still some of those consequences that are still coming to pass, but you have received forgiveness from him. And in his eyes, it is no more. It's as if it never happened because when his forgiveness comes, it is complete and it is total but you're still punishing yourself. You're still punishing yourself because you're experiencing some of the consequences. And listen, there's a way to hold tension of, I am completely forgiven by the Lord and he does not hold this over me anymore and there is no condemnation, he's not condemning me. And also, here's some things that are still just natural consequences of some of the things that I've done. And the way to hold that tension is to ask the Lord, God, show me how you see me, that I don't need to deal with this with shame, but I can deal with it with responsibility. That I can really say, God, 
I trust you with this. And listen, because of his grace, he always gives us way less than we deserve when it comes to consequences, way less. But there are some things sometimes that are gonna build our character that he's gonna still have us endure when we fail, when we do things that we know that we should not do and we did it anyway. But God is gracious and kind. And then if you want to on your own, you can read Psalm 51, which is the response of David's heart to the words of Nathan. And this whole psalm is um, a psalm of repentance and forgiveness and restore um, restore what was stolen from me um, or what was taken from me. And he, that's where we get this part, um, a really famous part of Psalm 51 is, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you again. And guess what? God does. <laughs> he does. David's life shows us that God is kind and faithful and he's also just and he's righteous and that no one is perfect and the fact that David is still called a man after God's own heart, even after all of the things that he does, shows you that what matters most is your response when you do something wrong. What matters most is your response when you are confronted. What matters most is your response when people say, hey, this is a good idea, but I don't think it's a God idea. What does your heart look like when you're confronted? Do you double down? I'm right. I know that I'm right. Nobody sees things the way I see them. God tells me everything. Listen, if God tells you everything, you need to revisit that. That's how cults are born, <laughs> so please don't do that. One thing that's so common with a good leader is they have a soft heart. A good leader has a soft heart. And it's so different from what we see modeled for us out in the world. That is not good leadership. Doubling down when somebody confronts you, doubling down when you know you've done something wrong, but it's like, oh, but I can't admit it. That would show weakness. Do you know how far it would go if our leaders would be like, I, I messed up royally. That was awful. I should have never done that. God, help me. I need, I need a time of repentance, a time of forgiveness, and I actually need to walk away. And listen, I'm not talking about just in the world. I'm talking about in the church world with pastors and leaders. Instead of doubling down, you're right. I was wrong. I need to repent. Why don't you stand with me? So just like at the beginning I said, a lot of us are never going to be maybe in a spot of leadership that would be a king or a queen or a ruler or anything like that. But you are leading somebody. Every one of you in this room is leading somebody somehow. Could you close your eyes with me? Because before I ever bring a sermon to you, I allow the Lord to preach it to me. We are all leading somebody. What is our response in those moments when we're confronted? What are those moments? What, are, what is our response in those times where somebody's like, with fear and trembling, they're like, I know this seems like a good idea, but I don't think it's God's best. And like, maybe we should stop and we should pray. What if it comes from somebody that's a stranger like Abigail? What if it comes from a close friend like Nathan, who's a prophet? What do we do? Our heart should be, God, help me to be a good leader. A good leader is faithful with the task at hand, just like David in the fields. A good leader is obedient to God even when it's inconvenient, just like David in the cave when he could have killed Saul and saved himself a ton of trouble, but he listened to the voice of the Lord. A good leader listens to those around them when they are giving you good, sound advice, even if you don't believe it right at that moment. But it's worth praying about. And a good leader repents quickly when confronted about sin. God, I pray that you would create in us a clean heart, oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit in us today.
God, let us not look at the world and even at politicians and, and point out all of the things that are grossly wrong in that world without looking at ourselves first, saying, Lord, I want to be a good leader. Let it start with me. The things I'd like to see out there, let them be done in me first. Let me lead my children well. Let me lead my household well. Let me lead my friends well at school or at work. Let me lead my teams well in my workplace. Let me lead our congregation well as pastor. God, start with us. Start with us. Create in us a clean heart over you today, I pray that as you go home, if there's things that the Lord needs to convict you over, that you would invite that. If there's conversations you need to have with people who have tried to confront you and you didn't listen, maybe you need to have that conversation. Knowing that the Lord has good for you, his, his view of your life is so different than yours. His plans and purposes for your life are so much bigger than this small compartmentalized view that we can have because we're human and we do not get to see things the way that God sees them. But we can trust him with our future. God, you are good. You are faithful. You are strong. You are the best leader that has ever existed. And we are grateful here in this moment for your grace for us for your patience with us and for showing us that there are ways where there don't seem to be one, even in our own lives, no matter what our past looks like. In Jesus' name, amen.